Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Chavez Lamar, Director of the Indian Arts Research Center at SAR. Welcome to the Indian Arts Research Center Speaker Series. Today's presentation is Tribal Archives, Ethics, and the Right to Access. Our guest speaker is Peter Chestnut, who is managing shareholder of Chestnut Law Offices in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His legal work emphasizes Indian affairs and water law, serving primarily Pueblo Indian tribal governments and their business entities. He has provided legal advice and representation to Pueblo governments and worked with tribal record keepers for over 30 years. Chestnut has also worked with archivists at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center to establish and maintain the archive of documents belonging to the four Pueblos involved in the state of New Mexico versus Amet, a leading Pueblo Indian water rights case. He has also addressed the Tribal Archives Institute sponsored by the Western Archives Institute. Please welcome Peter Chestnut. Thank you. Um, good noon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's an honor to be here, and I appreciate being asked to speak. Uh, I feel uh, pretty humble in the face of uh, people who work with archives full time, because uh, I certainly don't. Um, as a practicing lawyer, uh, my work is, as uh, Cynthia said, with primarily with tribal governments, and so I've had a chance to work with records, and I'll be talking, trying to weave together some of my experience along with uh, with some of the uh, the research that I've done in preparation for the talk. I think uh, maybe I should start out by saying that maybe the title would be better, Pueblo Tribal Archives Preserving the Past for the Future, that uh, in Pueblos there is no right to access in terms of, of documents that the tribes have, that uh, if you can establish that there's a benefit to the tribe for why they should share their information with you, maybe they'll do it. But uh, uh, for those, it's, it's a cultural difference, and I'll talk about it more in the, in the course of our discussion. Um, I would like to give thanks at the beginning for uh, some assistance from some archivists, uh, particularly Diane Bird over at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, and uh, Dr. Rose Diaz at the uh, Indian Pueblo Cultural Center shared some materials with me and tried to weave some of those thoughts into my talk as well. Um, I'll mention a few of the things that we've worked on that relate to this topic and then, then dive into, uh, into the outline. Uh, one of my early cases involved going to the National Archives and uh, retrieving records for a tribe's claims case, and then going to the lawyer that represented the tribe in that claims case and uh, getting him to let go of the files that he'd been holding uh, for the tribe about that case, and that was the start of, of their archives back, uh, back in the 80s. Um, we also uh, helped us, well, had a case that established the right for a tribe to uh, bring a case in federal court against a federally funded museum that was holding an artifact that uh, was part of the cultural patrimony of that Pueblo. And uh, initially the federal court said, well, you know, it has to be found after 1990 and yours was found before then. And so we had to take a case to the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals that said, no, if it's in the museum and it's federally funded, NAGPRA applies. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that case and had a, a, a surprise ending for me anyway. Uh, we also addressed confidentiality concerns in a number of contexts, including litigation, particularly water rights, which are multidimensional, that you look back into history and archaeology, and you hire experts to pull all that together. And so it becomes a repository of knowledge that uh, is certainly educational to, to the lawyers, but also to the tribal people involved. Government-to-government uh, -government consultations, uh, we get involved in that and help develop documents and protocols to protect cultural information that tribes have that need to be considered in federal projects, but uh, we want to do it in a way that respects the tribe's uh, preference for confidentiality and keeps them in control of what information is made available to the public. Um, and in connection with the water rights litigation, it was mentioned uh, the archive at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that was, uh, we set up a written agreement, and it was, it was a wonderful 
uh, transition that uh, the Amet case uh, started back in 1966, and it's not done yet. Uh, but the archives at the cultural <laughs> yeah right, the archives at the cultural center have the first 20 years of Pueblo involvement uh, from 74 to 90, 96, and when uh, William Schaub, the, the lead lawyer, at that, retired. Uh, his firm didn't want to keep the records anymore, and happily the Cultural Center made space available with, with control by the Pueblos. Um, and so that was, uh, was my, uh, another contact with archives. As I've said, tribal archives, and I think, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any Pueblo that really has a functioning archive at this point that's open to the public. There's, a, there's record keeping, and I'll talk about that, but you know, archive in the sense of you know, here's what's set up for the public, is not something that, that the Pueblos are, are really to that point. But there's people who are training in archival techniques and practices, and so it's my belief that as time goes by, uh, and, and as time has gone by, that there's been an increasing attention to record keeping and, and how to do it well. Um, I do want to mention that not only are the tribal archives not open to the public, but they're also not subject to the Freedom of Information Act that applies to federal agencies, and they're not subject to the Inspection of Public Records Act that applies to state agencies. But, and this is one of the things the tribes pay attention to, is if you give materials to those governments, then it can become available to the public. And so that's, again, part of what we have to work with on the legal side is to uh, inform our clients of that fact and then work with them to make sure that what they disclose what they want to disclose and what they don't want to disclose isn't inadvertently disclosed. Um, one of the materials that I was provided uh, through Diane's help was the Society of American Archivists, and I'm delighted to find there is one, has uh, a set of core values and uh, a code of ethics. Since ethics is in my title, I thought I'd touch on at least what are the main topics that are in an archivist's code of ethics. Uh, professional relationships is one. Uh, judgment, and this is really critical. Um, appraising, acquiring, uh, processing materials to ensure they're authentic and uh, the, that they have the lasting value for the culture and, and history that, that they're accumulated for. Authenticity is a value. Security and protection is important. Access and use, and that involves the part of the balance we'll talk about is uh, what is available and on, and on what uh, on what conditions. Uh, privacy, uh, and this is very important from the Pueblo standpoint. That uh, I, I've come to feel that basically you get information on a need-to-know basis, and so. As records are accumulated, it's important that they be kept in ways that people who need to get access to them can, but that others, uh, uh, it's not just, just generally available to everyone, and trust. So these, these are the ethical considerations of, of archivists, and um, I was real glad to get that, because I think I have a lot of respect for keeping track of records and, and the work that goes into indexing them, and. Uh, when we moved the Emmett Archive over to, uh, to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, Diane was the archivist there, and she spent a bunch of time you know, putting it into acid-free folders and putting on labels where the glue had fallen off over the past 20 years and making sure that, uh, that things were what they said they were and making lists of what were in the boxes. And, and the law firm did a good job of that, and, and I personally carried that forward as the custodian for the next 20 years of the Emmett case. Uh, so that we have, you know, by, box by box lists and lists of the uh, of the of the information we have, for, so the tribes can use it when they want to. So, what is an archive? I went to the dictionary, and uh, the American Heritage Dictionary says it's a place or collection containing records, documents, or other materials of historical interest, or a repository for stored memories or information. And uh, Black's Law Dictionary has a definition of archive as well, and it says a place where public and historic or institutional records are systematically preserved. Collected, preserved, public, historic, or institutional papal or, 
papers or records, and any systematic compilation of materials, especially writings, in physical or electronic form. And it's become clear that electronic form has grown, uh, certainly during my legal career. So the primary focus on tribal record keeping is the benefits to the tribe and its members. And the function of an archive can be in, in, in numerous places. As I say, that tribes don't have, you know, here is this archive building with an archivist sitting there to greet you when you walk in. Um, the one place that's closest to that is the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center, that, and they're upgrading their, their system there. It's really nice. But in, in a small Pueblo, it could be in the governor's office, right? It could be his assistant is the one that keeps track of the resolutions that are passed by tribal council and the agreements that are signed on, after approval by council. Some tribes have a tribal administrator who's in charge of keeping track of the paperwork. Um, there can be a records person or a records manager whose job it is to, to support tribal officials in keeping track of the records as a custodian and uh, handling active documents that are generated by or received by the tribal governments. And after enough years, they can become archival. Uh, some records are in accounting, right, for the financial and contract work. Uh, personnel and human resource files are kept usually in that area. And programs can be uh, repositories for records. Uh, one example that I had uh, got called in after a tribal audit was challenged. And they said, well, you didn't document your in-kind, con the auditor didn't find the in-kind contribution for this program. And so the leader said, well, do we have to pay back all the money? And I said, no, you just have to find records that showed that you did the in-kind work. And of course, nobody who was an officer then was an officer when the audit was done. But the program people had the records. And so they remembered and they invoked, it was you know parent in-kind contributions, like the kid's now in fourth grade, what did you do in Head Start? But we were able to create the documents, pull them together, show them to the auditor, who says, well, now that I've been educated, they did meet that requirement and the tribe didn't have to send back any money. And I was happy to, uh, to have been part of that effort because the initial thought was, oh, they're asking for it, we gotta give it back. And I said, no, I don't think so. If you can answer this question, then you don't have to give it back. And so, uh, the, what was someone called me? The decentralized record keeping was called <laughs> into play. <laughs> and lo and behold, uh, records were found. Uh, another place where records are kept is in a museum or cultural center. And uh, the Pueblo of Acoma built a beautiful building, a real jewel, uh, the Sky City Museum. Sky City uh, Cultural Center and Haku Museum. And uh, I think they've got, they've got a wonderful space that can serve the Pueblo for many, many years to come. And there's space in there that's designed for water rights records. They've set up a room for that. And they have some underground rooms for uh, storage of, of various objects. Uh, and there can be an archive, as I mentioned, at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. Uh, which has private and public sections. The Amit records are not available to the public. They have to get approval from either a tribal leader or a, or a lawyer to get into those records. Our thought is when the case is finished, now scheduled for 2017, on its 51st birthday, that um, you know maybe some of it will become open to the public at that time. Or, and we have made it available to other Pueblos in their water rights cases to look at things like the Pueblo Lands Board. A great deal of work was done for that. And, Spanish and Mexican times. These water rights cases have done a lot of work to accumulate uh, documents from that time, have them translated, and then through deposition process to put people on the record to say, what are these documents, what do they mean, and would it surprise anyone to know that there could be differences of opinion as to what the words are that are handwritten on a 300-year-old piece of paper? Um, in a language using orthography that isn't used anymore. I'm not surprised anymore. Uh, we should remember that tribal staff time is limited, and so any, any contact with them uh, has to be at their convenience. Uh, but I think, as I said, there's a real effort to develop some best practices and, uh, and educate uh, the rising generation and, and record keepers into how to do that. So a scope and a mission for the archive, what would that be? I think generally, I'll talk about two kinds of materials, special collections and institutional records. Uh, I think there can be artifacts 
that get returned, but we're not going to talk about that in terms of today. Um, tribal archives can have several purposes, including gaining some control over its material and history, intellectual property, and cultural rights. Um, Congress went so far as to pass a law saying that tribal seals are protected under copyright law so that people can't just photocopy some of these beautiful tribal seals and use it without the tribe's permission. Uh, preserving records of the past for the future use by future generations is what I think of as part of what an archive does. And it's an opportunity for tribal people to learn what has been written about them and including what is available, and that can include what's available to the general public. And there are now books that were published in the 30s that tribes do not want to make generally available. And so they can curate them in ways that if it comes into their hands, it's hard to get a hold of them because they feel that they didn't give permission the first time and that it's presented in ways that they don't feel are, are appropriate for today. Uh, it allows tribal people access to historical documents and obtain accurate information about the tribe for self-determination purposes and gives tribal members a chance to respond if there's something that they think was improperly published or inaccurate. It gives control over documents for lawsuits, and I've had involvement with that, and it's a place to organize and accumulate records and hold material obtained from other institutions. And sometimes uh, places will say, you know what, well, we've got this material that you know, relates to your tribe, you know, but mom passed on, we don't want it, do you want it? And so uh, to be able to help that happen, and it can happen with land, that um, one Pueblo has, was willed pieces of property inside its grant that had been properly purchased by somebody who lived in Pennsylvania, and after they died, it's like, well, we don't want to we're giving it back to the Pueblo. And so it was nice to, to help, help that aspect as well. And so another purpose is to in inventory and catalog items in the collection and create a database. And uh, uh, so I think some archives have a public database and maybe another database of things that are more restricted so that uh, you don't have the public wanting to see things that they shouldn't be seeing. So how do people know about tribal archives? I think tribal members can know that the tribe's working on it. Schools are, are an important place that uh, studies that are done, you know, either in high school or uh, Santa Fe Indian School to learn more about, about their Pueblo um, and archives can help with that. And tribal consultants, historians, and archeologists, uh, we've had some wonderful opportunities to see interactions between tribal members and uh, and experts, so that the experts write up the story in a way that's acceptable to the, to the Pueblo. But the Pueblo people themselves are not subject to cross-examination on their beliefs, and we think that's real important. And we had to, I'll talk a little bit further on about a case where we had to put record, put a deposition under seal, because they started going, well, let's tell us about this activity, and what does that mean, and who does that? And it's like, we don't want to go there. So we use consultants in the legal field to try to minimize that kind of risk of exposure. So to preserve the intellectual and physical integrity of the records involves a judgment of access and confidentiality, and the, guard, and the archivist is really the gatekeeper for that. And uh, so tribal archives can control access, and it's certainly uh, including protecting sensitive information. We've talked about the Emmett Archive at uh, the Cultural Center is in a locked room, and the key to it's in my office. <laughs> so if somebody wants to come in, they call up and we talk to them. Um, we've talked about the Sky City Cultural Center having some space there. Um, but one of the functions that I think, and I want to suggest this to archivists in the crowd, that can be useful is publicly available information that might be of value to tribes. And these might have to do with uh, environmental impact statements uh, say that, well, we're involved in where somebody wants to mine uranium in a particular area. And so the federal agency has to look at the environmental impacts. And so when they do, they come up, they have a, a scoping session, they have a draft report, and then they have a final report, and then a record of decision. And that record of decision and the final EIS are public documents. 
And so that and the administrative record for these processes can be a good source of information about lands or animals or plants that, uh, and cultural resources that are important to tribal people. And so part of what I'd like to suggest is that even if tribal archivists can't necessarily disclose things that are confidential on the tribal side, to point people who are interested toward public information that may be of, of use and interest is, is something that I think would fit within the code of ethics of, of, an, of an archivist. Um, tribal audits, very hard to get if you go to the tribe, but if you go to the federalclearinghouse.gov, uh, they're public documents. And so, uh, again, for people who are interested in, in that, that's something that an archivist can point out, and I'm mentioning here. Court filings, things that are filed in court are public records. And uh, the Emmett case has over 8,000 documents. Uh, they number them consecutively now, and there's an electronic filing process. But uh, So that's a place to look. Uh, and when there's trials, the, those exhibits uh, can be publicly available. It can take some work to get at them, but those are sources. The Federal Register publishes all kinds of things, and uh, sometimes notices, sometimes laws, tribal laws, that, uh, for example, if a tribe is going to sell liquor, they have to have a federally approved liquor law, and those get published in the Federal Register. And so uh, that's another source of information that an archivist might want to be aware of. Uh, these days you can consider scanning uh, documents that are that are fragile as a way of making them available to people. But the heart of it is really balancing the interests of privacy and disclosure as part of the archivist's challenge. And so developing a written policy on handling uh, privacy-sensitive records is worthwhile. Now, this will include developing a general screening policy and identifying existing collections which contain privacy-sensitive material. Uh, there's a legal principle called prior publication, and that means if it's already been published, it's publicly available, then it's hard to say that it's private. However, um, tribes have uh, approached uh, archives and said, you know, even though you have this book that's, that's been published and everything, there's pieces in there that aren't right, and we didn't get our approval, and we don't want you to, uh, to share that. And uh, there are archives that... Uh, that have respected that. And I think that's part, part of the balance, that uh, you, know, you don't want to share bad information. And you know, if some outsider's writing a book saying, well, here's what I think you know, during my six months or two weeks or whatever it was at this place, and here's, my, here's the story, I think an archivist who says, I listen to people who lived there, whose grandparents lived there, they're still there, they're saying it's not right. Maybe that's not something that we want to, to amplify and pass on. Obviously, you don't want to do a lot of that, but I think for key, for key pieces, it's, it's, uh, that respect is very important. Um, and archives have to respond appropriately to a series of, of dimensions, cultural, social, and political environments in which you work and live. And that role involves both providing access and protecting the subjects of the records. Here's a quotation I came across that I like. It says, any ethical stand constrains somebody's freedom. That does not mean such a stand is unreasonable or unjust. In the end, our acceptance of limitations on the pursuit of knowledge in order to protect the greater interest is what distinguishes us as moral beings. So I think there's a moral dimension you know, to what are you carrying forward and how are you protecting it and how are you making it available to the future. So that quote is from somebody named Heather McNeil in her book, Without Consent, The Ethics of Disclosing Personal Information in Public Archives. And apparently it's available through the Society of American Archivists. Um, I have a whole section on copyright issues, but I think I'll just touch on it a little bit here, that... Um, According to, to some of the written materials, the archivist itself doesn't necessarily need to secure a copyright permission, but researchers who want to use the material do. And so being educated about that is, is worthwhile if people are considering publication. 
Copyright law allows permissible fair use, which includes looking at documents, taking notes, making single copies of, for study, quoting some but not all uh, of the protected content, and that's not infringing on copyright. But if you're looking at commercial use, you really need to get permission from the copyright owner. And I won't go into all the details of the different kinds of rights there are, but uh, one of the favorite ones, I listen to the radio reader sometimes in the morning, and he gets streaming rights, right? Well, 20 years ago, there were no streaming rights, right? But now that's a new right that's recognized, and somebody has to get permission. And you want to get those permissions in written form. Uh, there was also a law passed in 1990 called the Visual Artist Rights Act, which gives copyright protection uh, for the rights of attribution and integrity. And what that applies to paintings or drawings, prints, sculpture, and photos in limited editions of under 200, where they're, they're signed or marked and consecutively numbered. And those reside with the artist. They're not transferable, and they're for life, and they can be waived. But I think the idea is that you don't want to have somebody just grab this and start to do something else with it without the artist having the opportunity to, uh, to say, wait a minute, that's not what I had in mind. That's not a fair presentation of what I'm doing or what I did. So there's a whole book called Navigating Legal Issues in Archives by someone named Menzi Bernd Klott, for those that want to get further into, into the copyright piece. Um, types of records. Um, there's a lot of different types that go into collections. These can include legal cases, which can be dozens of boxes of documents. Right now, we're involved in subproceeding one of a case that's only 30 years old, and uh, we have an entire room that's filled with boxes. And the other week, somebody disclosed 4,000 documents on a CD. It's like here. And you can question this person tomorrow about what he looked at. So it's only getting worse in terms of the volume that, uh, that, our, uh, that, that an archivist may have to contend with. So legal cases, tribal program records, reports of studies conducted on tribal lands, and this could be you know, if they're building a road or putting in a housing development. With federal money, there's going to be these environmental impact statements, and so these are opportunities to learn something about, about the tribe through those public documents. Maps, there can be articles on tribal activities, and tribal government records, oral histories. Uh, one Pueblo did a very beautiful thing. I thought that there was an archaeologist who'd worked with him when he was a graduate student back in the 50s on their claims case. and So he was getting very elderly, and so they wanted him on their water case, which didn't start till 30 years later. And so they got a younger archaeologist to interview the old guy. And then they hired a, a video recorder to tape the conversation. And you know, there was talk about what topics do we want to talk about. And so this was done with an idea that this would be preserved for uh, future use of Pueblo members. Um, so archives can include cult culturally sensitive materials, which might be still or moving images, photographs, films, graphic art recordings, transcriptions, or maps. Uh, we've learned that maps get a lot of attention sometimes. And it's easy to forget, you know, from where we are in the 21st century that, you know, even back in the 19th century when the U.S. Army is coming out here for the first time, it's like, what are they seeing? How are they drawing the land? And part of what we found is they do a, some of maps are fabulous and others really sketchy. Um, but they're bits of the past, and it's how it looked at the past. And, and so it's, it's important to keep track of those and, and know what you have there. There can also be records and documents, including books with personal or family information, archaeological data, religious materials, or ethnobotanical materials. There's, uh, there's a guy named Richard Ford, I think, who's written on ethnobotany of the Tewa lands. And, to my mind, that's, re that's real valuable because I think the Pueblo perspective has a lot of we're part of life in this area and what other life is in this area and how do we weave that together. Governance records are gener generated by tribal governments or institutions 
uh, tribal council and administration. Uh, tribal law can make some documents public, but absent that, the uh, uh, I'd say the, the default is not. But there's one Pueblo that recently passed the new governing agreement that said our tribal council agendas are public, our meetings are public, the minutes are public, the resolutions are public, and they keep a notebook out in the reception area for their members to, to see. So that's a tribal choice. Others, you can't get into the tribal council meeting until you're invited in, and you may sit and wait for hours. I have certainly had that experience. And they say, they're ready for you now, and bring you in. Uh, some Pueblos compile written laws and update them from time to time, and we've been involved in that, and I'll quote from one a little bit later. We've talked about, mentioned financial and employment records and audits and program deliverables that you could get a contract to produce uh, children's books. And uh, there have been times, you know, even tribal presses to, to print materials. And I think keeping track of those things is, is something that, it, that it would be valuable in a tribal archive. Uh, legal material, uh, as I said, our office has been a de facto archive uh, for, for the clients that we represented for a long time. The litigation cases, the land and water, developed history, and transactions, land transactions, reacquiring land. Um, it's been one of the, the very nice things that's happened uh, is with the development of, of tribal uh, economics and tribal economies, tribes have had money to actually reacquire some of their ancestral lands that were taken from them uh, in years past. And it was interesting for me to observe that the preference is to acquire lands that are right next to the lands they already control. So, you know, a developer might come in and say, well, would you like to buy this property and over by Coors and Corrales Road? It's a great opportunity. You could make a lot of money. It's like, no, we're not really interested. But this piece of grazing land that fills in a hole, you know, or the keyhole in, in some lands we already have, we're very interested in that. And so one tribe has bought enough land, more than doubled their land base, and gotten out to their southern boundary that's like 50 miles from where, from where their uh, tribal headquarters are. But it was something that was very important for them, and we had the privilege of working to uh, make those transactions happen. Uh, let's see. Of course, attorney-client communications privileged, and so that's... Uh, certainly not available during active uh, times, but when we did reacquire the uh, Indian Claims Commission records for this one Pueblo, we got the attorney notes. And I'm at a point in my career where I'm looking to see if tribes are interested in taking possession of all of the materials that I've developed on their behalf through the years. And uh, you gotta just take the risk that you're not gonna be horribly embarrassed or regret that the notes that you took at the time, you know, get looked at by somebody later. But uh, when I found it helpful to, to see those yellow, yellow no, the handwritten notes, and sometimes it's pretty unclear what it means, but other times you get a, you get a, a shaft of insight that's very helpful for what you're doing. And it seems to me that's part of what researchers look for is. You, how do you find the needles in the haystack? And so you gotta have a haystack if you're gonna find a needle inside it. And, I, and so legal records can be part of that. Um, another cultural and traditional activity we were involved in is the Mount Taylor uh, listing it as traditional cultural property uh, through the uh, uh, Cultural Properties Review Commission of the state. It was a major effort by five tribes. I mean, we know where Mount Taylor is. It's, the only snow-capped peak for, you know, 100 miles in any direction. Uh, and so Hopi and Navajo and Zuni and Ackerman and Laguna all cooperated to nominate this as, as traditional cultural property. And uh, in the course of that, uh, Navajo generated some fabulous maps, but we had two sets, one that could be publicly available and one that had more precision in terms of identifying archaeological sites that the tribes did not want to, to be publicly available. And so they were presented to the uh, uh, in, in confidence, and that, and that was respected. 
And courts have a process called in-camera review. If there's something you think that shouldn't be made public, you can ask the judge to keep it from being public, to seal that record. And so, uh, so we had to do that one time with, uh, with this deposition I was telling you about, that, uh, where they're grilling a tribal elder on matters that should not be on the record. And, uh, and we got the federal judge to say, no, that's not going to be part of the public record. Uh, publications, there are some things that are publicly available, the tribes want publicly available, that uh, tourism materials, right, can have historic value. What, is, what, is, what did the tribe choose to emphasize at different times through time? Um, and Pueblo museums, uh, there's some beautiful, beautiful materials that are, uh, that are uh, sometimes artifacts, sometimes they're writings. Uh, one I want to mention is there's a photo history of uh, Jemez Pueblo up at the Walatoa Visitor Center. And uh, this is something that the Pueblo did in cooperation with the Forest Service, and they co-manage it. And there's a room that is filled with archaeological material, but also uh, a series of, uh, well, two, two different shows that have, were put together. Um, one that was based on uh, photographs from the 1930s, primarily, with a few from, from the Lummis era, era back in the turn of the, the last century, uh, with, with text. And my wife Elizabeth was involved in that one. And then another one that was done by another group that's a Florida ceiling of photos on a decade-by-decade on a decade basis through the 20th century. And so the, and these are pictures of sometimes there are people at the Santa Fe Indian School or you know, somebody coming home from the military or people farming or whatever, but these photos are insights that the Pueblo is willing to share with, uh, with the public. And so I think it's important to, to be aware that despite a tradition of secrecy, there are, there are publicly uh, available materials. Another one is a book called Acoma Pueblo in the Sky by Ward Allen Minge. He wrote it back in the 70s. He was a historian for Acoma in their claims case, and after it was over, he wrote it up as a book. And then 15 years later, he wrote another chapter for what happened in the 15 years since then. And I had uh, the opportunity to work with him and Pueblo leadership to put that together. And a very generous man. He didn't ask to be paid, and in fact, he gave his rights as author to the Pueblo. And so the Pueblo has done a third edition, uh, you know, because he got the plates, or they got the plates from him. And so uh, it can happen that there are publications that tribes support and like to have out there. Um, so applicable laws, uh, tribes, if they pass laws, that controls what really happens in terms of archives on their land. And uh, I'd like to quote from Acoma Written Laws. Uh, they have a section called Establishment of Tribal Records Office. And it says, the Tribal Council, having determined that efficient tribal record keeping is a benefit to all people of the Pueblo, and it is in the best interest of tribal government for the Pueblo to perform this function rather than the Bureau of Indian Affairs, hereby creates the Tribal Records Office. It shall be the responsibility of the Tribal Records Office to keep accurate records concerning tribal government activities. That was done in 1996, and I talked to the, uh, the person who runs that office now, and he said that what had been the Acoma Archive back in the 80s is now within his orbit, and he's going through the old documents and deciding what to keep and, and uh, you know, what to let go of. And so it's, as I say, the function can, can be in a variety of places. Uh, the Federal uh, Freedom of Information Act doesn't apply directly to tribes. And in preparing for this, I had a whole memo done on FOIA and you know what are the nine exceptions and what are the cases that dealt with that tribes and FOIA. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but there are two Supreme Court cases that deal with tribes and the Freedom of Information Act, uh, tribal records. One was uh, involved the Klamath tribe uh, back in 2001, Department of Interior and BIA versus Klamath Water Users Protective Association. And the Supreme Court held there that where uh, the tribe and its consultants had shared litigation strategy in a water rights case with the Bureau of Indian Affairs as part of the government-to-government -government relationship and the trust responsibility, the Supreme Court said, well, 
that's not confidential. That can be disclosed to the other side in the water rights case. So that was a real setback. And it made, to my mind, just added another layer of caution to what you want to hand over to the United States government. You can talk to them and they can take notes, but do you really want to hand something over if in turn it's going to be disclosed to the other side in an active case as it was there? And the Supreme Court said, well, the government can keep its consultants confidential because they don't, they don't have an interest. They're just trying to get to the truth, but the tribe has an interest, and so therefore, you know, that kind of destroys the rationale for keeping consultant records secret. I didn't find it particularly persuasive, but uh, I'm not on the Supreme Court. Uh, then in 2011, there was another case where the um, Hickory Apache Nation tried to get a hold of information about its trust accounts from the United States government. And the Supreme Court said, uh, no, you can't get all that you're going after. We pat Congress passed a law called the American Indian Trust Fund Management Reform Act. If it says you get records, those are the records you get, and you don't get the other ones. So from a, a tribal attorney standpoint, these are not happy cases, right? Because it's saying, well, if the tribe gives it, it can get turned over, but if the tribe wants to know what is the government doing with its own records, uh, it's harder to get at. And they, they had a rationale there. It's like, well, you know, you provided some of that, or they had to do it. But um, FOIA does not generally apply to what's in tribal control, and so it's just another reason to be careful about what you give to the government. Uh, another law that's important is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA. Passed in 1990, it applies in the United States. And I think I've been hearing a little bit about some Hopi masks that are trying to get sold in France or something like that. Well, NAGPRA doesn't reach over there. That jurisdiction only goes to the, the boundaries of the government that issues the law. And so just like tribal laws pretty much apply inside tribal boundaries, U.S. laws apply within U.S. boundaries with exceptions that don't apply here. Um, so NAGPRA uh, does create a cause of action for tribes in federal court. And importantly, it establishes community legal rights and protections for key types of cultural materials, including funerary objects, sacred objects, and cultural patrimony, as well as human remains. And it determines that these are inalienable; they can't be sold. And they belong to the tribe, and it places the burden of proof on whoever has these items to show on institutions, why should you hold this if the tribe says it's theirs? And so we've been involved in some repatriation efforts that we've, uh, there was a criminal prosecution in Arizona where uh, some dealer had some materials that were taken uh, from a tribe and we helped prepare the tribal witness to be able to say, yeah, this was from our church and it was taken and it shouldn't have been taken and nobody is authorized to sell it. And that guy went to prison and the materials came back to the Pueblo. Uh, uh, I mentioned one about the federally funded museum. There was a, a pottery that was two, two pots, one on top of the other and, so, and then it was sealed in the middle. And they were from different eras according to the archaeologists. So there's like one from 1275 and another one's from you know, 1400. They're sealed together and inside is uh, a couple of, of feathers, uh, some eagle down and, uh, and some yucca that was woven into a, into a strand. And uh, the individual found it and brought it to Los Alamos. And so Los Alamos drilled a hole in it uh, to see what was inside. And then they used neutron radiation to get a clearer picture than x-rays. And then they put it on display in their museum for 11 years. And then the guy, the father of the guy who found it said, well, we want it back. And at that point, the Pueblo said, wait a minute, that shouldn't belong to them. So we got the state court case dismissed. We went to federal court. And after we established that the court had jurisdiction, and then this discovery started, and... Uh, and the tribal leaders had an extraordinary meeting and said, we're not going any further with this. And they said, we got into this because we were protecting what the ancestors did. 
but this has taken on a life of its own. It's like it came back to life as an entity, and and they just weren't willing to you know to to uh, expose their tribal uh, perspective and their their cultural views to cross examination in federal court. And it's like, well, we tried ancestors, but you know we're not we're not going to jeopardize those of us that are living now in our ways. And so uh, I felt very honored to be asked to explain the legalities to it, and then they went into their tribal language, and at the end they said, let it go. Okay, you're the client. Um, but in the course of that, we did accumulate some pretty interesting documentation, and we got affidavits from the state archaeologist, we got affidavits from the state ethnologist to say that this was cultural patrimony of this tribe. It should not be sold. So, let's see, what else? Um, more recently, uh, items appear on eBay. And uh, sometimes a tribe will say, you know, if it's $25, let's just buy it back. And sometimes, we had one case where we had to deal with an auction house out in San Francisco and got them to pull these items from, from auction. Um, that didn't go to court, but it... Uh, it took the threat of that for the auction company to decide that they really didn't want to have that kind of activity associated with their name. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution has numerous branches, several different parts. The National Museum of American History for years had the reception area of the Santa Clara Pueblo Governor's Office on display, you know, right down to the bulletin board with job descriptions and, you know, pictures of... Uh, you know, somebody's pickup truck and whatnot. Uh, the National Museum of Natural History, National Museum of American Indian, National Museum of Art, National Portrait Gallery, and the Smithsonian Archives and Libraries. Well, NAGPRA doesn't technically apply to Smithsonian, they've been very uh, forthcoming in terms of, of repatriating, and uh, they have records in each one of these institutions pertaining to Indians or Pueblos. And they, they sponsor programs to help, uh, including employment, for uh, Pueblo and tribal folks to see what's in the collection and learn techniques from them. And I think there may be some people here who've, who've had that experience. And tomorrow, those, are, those are happy tax dollars at work, as far as I'm concerned. Um, the Library of Congress uh, is something I don't know a whole lot about, but they've got a lot of information. They started out, I think, with Thomas Jefferson's library and have grown from there. And uh, back in 97, they published a, a book called Many Nations, a Library of Congress resource guide for the study of Indian and Alaska Native peoples. And I suspect it could be available online. It may have been updated. Uh, and I, in the course of pre preparing for this talk, I learned that they their archivists are are trying to be proactive in terms of blogging and trying to put information out there that might be of interest to the public. Uh, and it's done electronically. And so that's another dimension that archivists might want to look at. The National Archives. At first, I thought it was just there was one building that was the National Archives. <laughs> Not even. That, uh, but I did was sent to Washington to look at, at records. And so and I called ahead. and. And they brought the boxes in, and you know, so I go through the, the several boxes of Department of Justice records for this claims case. And so they have record groups by the different agencies of the government. Um, and so you can look for Department of Justice, you can look for BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, you can look for Department of Interior, and they keep them in different places for whether it's at the agency or the region or area office or at headquarters. And so there's a cottage industry of historians who know where, where to find these records and what the record groups are. Uh, I think I'm running through my time here, but I do want to mention the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. That's the one that generates environmental impact statements, or sometimes called a, another layer is called an environmental assessment, where it's a somewhat less rigorous study. It doesn't study quite the 22 topics that are in the latest EIS I'm working on. 
but they look at it, biological resources, water resources and water quality, cultural resources, land uses, including recreation and agriculture, socioeconomic conditions, and as I say, they produce a record of decision and a published environmental impact statement. And it's certainly my suggestion that there's value in trying to keep track of those and maybe try to collect them for ones that the tribe's involved in. And through time, uh, that would be another source of useful information. Within NEPA, there's an, uh, and if you're looking at the cultural resources, there's the National Historic Preservation Act applies. And section 106 of that uh, requires government agencies to consult with tribes that have cultural affiliation with, with lands or property that's involved. And this can produce interesting documents as well. Uh, and part of what I've learned is that agencies are quite sensitive to protecting information. And so when they make a map that shows cultural sites, they may show a 10-acre bullseye on a tree or on one building or on a lithic scatter, with the idea being that if people, what you don't want to do is, put a, is point to the things that you don't want people to find. And so uh, it's been, it's been uh, a good experience to realize how sensitive you know, some of our government land managers are to, to trying to, to balance the public's right to know with the tribe's right to protect culturally sensitive information. That's where I learned that to the top of the Santa Fe ski area has numerous traditional cultural properties. And in fact, the Forest Service has an agreement with tribes that are affiliated with that part of the world that allow them to get an annual report on how's it going, and uh, they'll help the tribal folks get up there to check it out. And I went on one of those visits, and we get off the chairlift, and the tribal folks head off in various directions, and a while later they come back, and it's like, it's all good. Um, but the forest didn't feel the need to follow them. It's like, you know, it's, you, it's your culture, and uh, we're here to help try to protect it. Uh, intergovernmental agreements can come about. Uh, right now, one tribe's working with the Corps of Engineers, several tribes are, uh, pertaining to water resources, and, uh, and so documents can come from that. A Department of Energy, Los Alamos, is surrounded by four tribes that have accords with them, and so they've been brought into the decision-making process, consultation process there. Um, uh, litigation records, I want to mention the Indian Claims Commission. UNM Library has a, 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 a multi-volume set of uh, rulings by the Indian Claims Commission from started in the 1940s and it ended in 1978. The cases that it decided, uh, many of the records are there. The um, cases that weren't finished went over to a court, which was the claims court, then it became the Court of Claims, then it's now it's the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, same building, um, in Washington, D.C. Uh, let's see. And so cases can come out of that uh, that are published. In, in federal re recorders, and, and often the facts are, are recited there. In the Amit case, there's a 30-page opinion that was published in 1985, and it has a map that shows where's the basin, and it goes through the, uh, the legal history of you know, Spanish and Mexican, as well as United States, are, are rolled up into that opinion. So those can be sources of information as well. Um, so, I think I'll uh, go to my conclusion now, it's a, so that maybe if there want to be a few questions, I'd be glad to, to try and deal with those. It seems to me that the archivist ethics promote access to information and Pueblo cultural traditions of secrecy uh, prevail with information available basically on a need-to-know basis. So the ethical archivist in Pueblo country is aware of cultural restrictions or consults with people who are aware of them. And she can also assist researchers by sharing knowledge of publicly available sources that might be relevant to their inquiry. So with that, I'll conclude my talk here and express my appreciation for you all coming and hope you've found uh, some useful information in this. Thank you.